Two balls and a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is way back. What the ball? Chris Taylor. Hi, everyone, and welcome into our live Dodger Heads postgame show presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Matthew Moreno, and joining me tonight is Scott Gearman, and it's perfect timing because I know, uh, Scott, you're someone who's been on the Tyler Glasnow train uh, for quite some time. So how are you feeling after watching your guy dominate tonight? Just an, honestly, just a a full circle moment for Tyler Glasnow. Fans uh, have deserved a, an ace like this. Honestly, they really have. Um, just a cool thing. See him go out there, put up on arguably one of the best starts of his career. Uh, strikeout wise, the third time of his career that he's had notch 14 strikeouts. Last came, uh, I think, in September 6th of last year against the Red Sox. So honestly, for me, got to sit back and just watch him shove. Uh, unbelievable stuff, right? I mean, there's so much to dive into about him. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to get into all that. We're excited for tonight's show. We want to thank everyone who's joining us live on Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, please remember to subscribe to our channel, ring the notification bell, and also hit the like button on this video. That's uh, It's a small final step, but it definitely really helps us. And if you're listening, wherever you get your podcast, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review there. All that good stuff as well. Uh, the plan for Scott and I is to touch on tonight's uh, highlights from the Dodgers 6-3 win. We're also going to discuss Chris Taylor, who I know a lot of people uh, have very strong opinions on. We we are seeing them on Twitter, and I've seen some of them in our uh, chat on the different shows we've been doing so far. Uh, and then we'll answer some questions at the end. Uh, but as a reminder, if you have something that you want us to immediately discuss, then Super Chat is definitely the way to go. Not only will we stop what we're doing to answer your question, but we'll put it up on the screen. Uh, and Super Chats also help our channel grow. So yeah, that's uh, that's all that stuff. Now let's let's get into it. Tyler Glasnow, as we said, Scott, you know he was spectacular tonight. He went seven innings, tied a career high with 14 strikeouts, uh, allowed just three hits, and he didn't allow a base runner until Austin Martin doubled with two outs in the third inning. And Scott, I don't know about you, but for me, there was a few more innings after that where I kept wondering if that one hit that James Outman almost made a diving catch on was going to end up looming uh, pretty large. Yeah, could have been early, but uh, he was able to really escape that. So uh, it was it was it was pretty remarkable. I, I really have, don't mind, have much to say other than that Tyler Glass now toted everything tonight. Um, James Altman at the plate. He's a guy notoriously streaky. Uh, caught a couple barrels today, big time. Yeah, yeah. Let's we'll we'll get into James Altman uh, yeah. with with Glass now. You know that double. That Altman almost made the spectacular catch on it was the only hit he had allowed. Max, Max Muncy made a pretty impressive play after that. Uh, Glasnow did strand the initial double with a strikeout, and that started a stretch of uh, striking out six batters in a row. So he was clearly in a rhythm. He was just overpowering the Twins lineup with a variety of his pitches. Uh, then later in the start, Austin Martin hit more of a true double down the third baseline, and so that sort of at least for me, I was able to breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief and not think, you know, what if Outman had made that crazy catch? With because Glassnow tonight, he had you know no hit stuff, right? Safe to say. Absolutely, yeah. Glassnow uh, averaged ninety eight ninety eight point three, or it topped out at ninety eight point three in the fastball. Uh, he was really, I know, I wrote in my game preview that I was really excited to see how much he would mix in the slider because they 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 platooned a bunch. They have you know, enough to really trot out a platoon that you know it feels like it could get the job done. But Glass now was big time tonight. Uh, four seam slider mixed in the curveball just a little bit. He threw twenty eight sliders. He didn't allow a hit on one of them. So it, he had it all working, and he really had a plan to attack those lefties. Really burying that slider back foot. Average ninety six point two on the fastball. Uh, Coming into today, he really he allowed a decent amount of contact. Like when it was there, it was there, but he only allowed three hard hits. Uh, so they had zero answer. I mean, we could talk all day, but he was mixing it. This was a terrific game uh, for Tyler Glass now in terms of uh, just able to navigate innings. And he could have gone farther, uh, but a six run lead, you didn't really have to push him at all. Yeah. And then I know the, the bullpen got a little shaky. We'll get into that. Yeah. as well uh so as as you said the three hits that glass now did give up the second one was the uh austin martin another double uh, i guess we could call him you know the proverb the glass now killer at least for tonight so. yeah uh, byron buxton had a single in the eighth but nothing you know came of that and those were kind of all the three hits that the twins had to speak of against glass now specifically uh you know scott you you touched on the different pitches that glass now had working and how he was mixing everything one thing I thought was pretty interesting, too, is, you know, a theme that has 
permeated throughout the sport is teams no longer really let starting pitchers go deep into games, right? Like it's a trend that we've been seeing for several years, the whole third time through the order thing. What I thought was interesting with Glass now is he mentioned that after his last start against the Giants, that he likes pitching deeper into games and facing a lineup a third time through because he thinks he finds a rhythm at that point and he's able to sort of navigate things. Is that what we saw kind of tonight? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I looked when I remember you at like we I did a story about that uh, and I and I looked and I was like, he hadn't had that many opportunities this year to really to do that. So I was curious to see uh, it was it was the timing was funny uh, on on seeing him do that today. So, yeah, he he did. He looked like he settled in. He had that comfortability factor to it. And he has the stuff where it's, you know, he's overpowering is one thing for starters, but it's another thing to be able to do that throughout the back end of your start. When you feel like the clock is kind of running out or you're reaching a pitch count or a point in the game where it might be best to get somebody out. But glass now when he's on, just like you saw today, he's able to continuously find a way to get these hitters out. Not just, not just forcing things. It's actually pitching. So he's not just a thrower. We saw a pitcher today. Yeah, that's a great point. And you know, it yeah. should be noted that uh, glass now's 14 strikeouts uh, over seven innings, and I think it. I think he was the first pitcher since Walker Bueller in 2019, I believe it was. Uh, so let's, yeah. It, I mean, it, 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 go ahead. Lists today. Yeah, there you yeah. go. I mean, it was just it was impressive all along. And before we we continue, let's pause really quick because we do have a super chat from Laura. So thank you for that. She just says, uh, "No question, just let's go Dodgers" with a bunch of clapping emojis. Laura, we appreciate that. There's certainly a lot of uh, excitement with tonight's win. This it it always works out nicely when the Dodgers have a there's reason to kind of celebrate and we're doing a live post game show after that. It's obviously a long season. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes there will be losses, but these, yep. uh, these are definitely fun when they're big highlights that we can get to before we, we put kind of the finishing touches on glass. Now, I think what's also been encouraging for, and you know, I was, when the Dodgers made the trade, like I was more on the skeptical side. I know amongst our staff, you and Blake were certainly more optimistic and encouraged over what he would be able to do provide to the rotation I worried about his injury history, although, you know, looking further into that, it seemed a little bit overstated and just kind of more circumstance mm -hmm. than like big trends that were actually reason to have significant concerns. But yeah. the fact of the matter is he hasn't really necessarily stayed healthy, but at least in the early going now, like we've seen him, what's I think most encouraging for me is obviously he's been healthy, but we've seen him building up kind of basically with each start, right? Like the Soul Series, it was a weird beginning, early start to the season, so they're going to be careful. He, he kind of struggled through that, was a little bit better against the Giants, and now even better against the Twins. And so, obviously, like, I'm not expecting him now to then go, you know, a complete game with 15 strikeouts his next time out, but to at least see that upward trajectory, because the rotation needs it. You know, the bullpen has been, we're only, you know, what, a, a little over a week into kind of resuming the regular season, and the bullpen's been overworked. And so to get these innings from Glass now is significant. Yeah, it's easy when Tyler Glass now is receiving like five plus runs a game of support. So you can, it's different. You can pitch differently there. Uh, Tampa, you know, when he was there, it's you play a different brand of baseball. Sure, they have like last year was remarkable to start the season. So, I mean, for me, when I was looking at him pitch last year uh, and he tallied a career high of innings, it was, you know, they were able to put up some runs, but some games it was all close stuff. So, when you're able to do that tonight, when you mix a guy like Glass now who can absolutely take over a game, you know, Spencer Strider stuff, big arm, can go out and just overpower you, rack up the strikeout numbers. It's different when it's you're you're playing from ahead. You can just attack, attack, attack. Um, so that might be the story. We you might be in for a career year from Tyler Glass now. And 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 to back to what we originally, you know, you brought up about when, when the trade first happened, and Blake and I were super, you know, high on it was because it, you, 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 they needed a guy who could go out and miss bats. You could take over a game because they don't have Walker Bueller. We had, he's not at that point yet. Kershaw's not at that point right now. So they needed that number one. Yamamoto, we had no idea. So we saw what the peak was for him and the, the cost that they gave up and who Ryan Pepio was at that point. Uh, this is exactly who we hope he can continue to be. Of course, tonight's an outlier, but it's a thing where you you say Tyler Glasnow could be a Cy Young. He's on a trajectory where this is stuff you're able to build on. You know the plan. The plan's already, yeah, yeah, Kira, absolutely. This is something that is repeatable. You know what he what can be mixed in, and the, the Twins aren't a bad team. Like This isn't like you're going out and shoving against the A's. You're going up against facing the Twins, who they're in, playing in the American League Central, and they're, you know, could push for a division title. So it's a good lineup. A lot of veteran bats over there. So 
this was the peak. This is exactly what it is. So it, it's early on. It was tough. Like, oh, you see, you know, Ryan Pepio, Johnny DeLuca, is that enough? And then the extension hits and now he's your ace. This is who you expect to be at the front end of your rotation for years. Yeah, well said. Uh, so after glass now, uh, Alex Vesia came in, gave up a, a solo home run in the in the uh, eighth. Dodgers still were, had a comfortable lead and so was in a safe situation. And here comes Connor Brogdon for his Dodgers debut, and it got off to uh, the worst possible start, I would say. He gives up a home run to Carlos yeah. Correa that was just you know obliterated to basically the, the second deck out there in left center field above the bullpen. Uh, and then Alex Kirilov made it back to back, uh, but Brogdon managed to sort of settle in there. There was kind of almost a misplay, but, you know, retired the next three batters. Yep. Uh, Scott, you and I haven't had a chance to talk yet. This is a, a trade the Dodgers made. They sent a minor league pitcher to the Phillies. Brogdon had been DFA'd. He's out of minor league options. So, you know, he's in the organization for now. But is he somebody you think that, you know, tonight, not necessarily withstanding, can he potentially be a value to the Dodgers bullpen at some point? I mean, if Pryor sees something in him, absolutely. Like people expect, oh, I, I know I'm seeing a bunch in the chat, like, oh, he'll be DFA tomorrow. That's just not, guys, that's just not the case. That, that won't happen. Like there's a reason you, they bring in, like they give up an asset with control to get him. So uh, Brogdon hasn't been bad in recent years. You look back he in from 21 to 22, 23 is fine. Like, you know, 21 to 3, 4, 3, 22, 3, 2, 7. Like there's obviously something there. Uh, and there's a reason why they brought him in. It's worth the dart throw. The Dodgers need the innings at the in the bullpen. It's without having to waste options on guys. That's mainly the thing. Like if you're pitching from ahead all the time, there's you need a like a plethora of arms to navigate all these innings. So if there's able to find lightning in a bottle somewhere, one simple fix, we won't know. I know I saw somebody mention it that it's going to take a few outings to really notice some changes. So. Will we find value? We don't know. Like he's not an overpowering arm. There's got to be something in there that they like, or he's just here to fill some innings. But I think that at this point, the Dodgers don't take just bring in anybody. There's calculated risks with all of it. Like Chris Matt, like my guy, like obviously there's something to them. Um, so I think that I, I don't think he's going to be a big piece, but they're, they're going to try to find something to make him a positive, but I don't think he'll be with the team long-term. With uh, you mentioned Chris Matt with him and Lamette, like they got DFA obviously, and they both cleared waivers. Are you surprised at all that they that they both went through? I know that they've had their struggles and all that, but they're still ex experienced major league pitchers. Chris Matt probably uh, Lamette. I don't. I, I think Lamette's had enough. Like he's bounced around enough to really uh, do that. Maybe probably both. I mean, the Dodgers bringing Chris Matt back. Uh, probably because, you know, keep him in the organization. He had some success. They must have a, you know, a mutual agreement that uh, he'll be brought up back up at some point. Lamette was just a, a dart throw and that what they thought they could fix didn't actually happen there. And, you know, you got to what he get a save. He got to save it like all oh, this past week. That's cool. But I don't, <laughs> I'm not surprised that they both cleared waivers. These are journeyman relievers, like journeyman, like right-handers. There's a ton of them out there. And a lot of teams are bringing up young guys to fill these spots. And I saw Michael with, I'm with you. I see Kyle Hurt. I want Kyle Hurt back in the bigs, big time. Like that's a guy that's sitting in AAA right now uh, with absolutely nothing left to prove. I know, I know. There's so much. Dodgers have so many guys that you could bring up and like everybody needs an opportunity. It's just a matter of, do you want to burn the options? Do you, where can you find these innings there? And Right now, they're really just, yeah, Drew Pomeranz, Blake. There's so many. There's just, where are they finding them? I don't, it's everywhere. Uh, speaking of pitchers, we do have another super chat. This one's from John Sue Kim. Thank you for this. He, uh, They say, pitcher injuries are a hot topic of the starters. Which do you suppose have mechanics that might be prone to injury based on the current theories? Uh, so, yeah, you know, Tommy John, UCL stuff, uh, flexor tendon, forearm strains, all of that, unfortunately, is – uh, dominating headlines, MLB and the Players Association are at odds over what's causing it. If the pitch clock is a factor, if it's not a factor, if maybe the baseballs are a factor, if those aren't. Uh, I know Tyler Glass now had was had some strong opinions of was a few years ago. Now uh, he was still with the Rays at the time. I think mm -hmm. it was when they imposed the uh, sticky stuff ban. Right, he was worried. Of, yeah, as much as that stuff wasn't supposed to be be used, like it was by to a varying degrees by different pitchers, obviously, and so. Uh, I know Glass now expressed some concern over what was going to happen with pitchers having to basically just completely stop without any uh, preparation. But to this question specifically, is there a Dodger starter that maybe you're uh, most worried about? 
on the roster right now are currently hurt because I've had one that I've had conversations <laughs> for a few years about that someone just looks like they're so violent throwing the ball. I mean, it's Dustin May. That's a guy who I'm I'm actually worried about make, making it back and and being effective like a lot like a, for a, you know a, a chunk of time. It's just. He just looks like he's not meant to throw a baseball. Like he, he'll be effective. Like that's what I mean. I know he's an incredible pitcher when he's healthy, but he just he's so has such a violent arm action and has such incredible movement, incredible spin, high velocity. That's a guy that you can press that into a now you have to pitch on a clock. Now you have to no sticky. You're not able to spin the ball. You have to generate that. Um <laughs> I, I outside of that, I'm just not sure. That's that's a tough one to answer. I mean, like anybody who throws upper 90s is at risk of stuff like this. So I, I think anybody like Blake Trinan, absolutely. That's someone I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm worried about there. But I think it's Dustin May. And like until we see him in that game setting, that's somebody who I'll, I'll always be worried about. Um, Kershaw, I'm not worried about. Walker Bueller, I'm not worried about. Um, I would say Dustin May, Blake Trinan, Tyler Glass now, we're going to knock on wood. I hate having to say that right now, but for the sake of the topic, um, I'm not a mechanics guy. I can only say that I've seen stuff on Twitter recently that there's a lot, like everybody, a majority of the arms who have recently had Tommy John, it's high velocity guys. So there's something there with stress on the arm. You're not meant to throw a baseball. The human body's just not meant to throw a baseball. So it's an, it's an unnatural movement, but it's just that it's all these high velocity guys getting hurt and that's just what we're seeing. So let's follow the trend there. I've said to them, like when I bring up the topic of uh, pitcher injuries, it's that I, I believe that, you know, pitchers might be uh, gripping the ball too hard or having to force that through and, and generate that spin, but it might be something else. That's just what I think. I'm not a pitcher. I just, that's just thinking of, of why these things are going on. Um, but I, I, it just all depends. Like I don't know, how much is the pitch clock having an effect? Like we just don't know. I think can uh, at the risk of maybe upsetting also some of our our viewers. Can I blame the stat nerds for wanting spin rate and this that and the other? Can I can I put this on you guys? Or just yeah, man, yeah, sure, yeah, hit me, do it. <laughs> I, I think, see. No, I mean, I, 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 I agree with you. I think the the high velocity obviously is is a contributing factor. Like everybody, we've seen you know pitchers are throwing harder than they ever have, right? And spin rates and all that are higher than they've ever been. And I think the the pressure and the work to achieve that is a factor. I also think that the pitch clock is a factor. Is the pitch clock the only reason? No. But I think this is a nuanced thing. And there's not, unfortunately, there's not just one thing that you can point to and say, okay, correct this or change this, and then pitchers will be fine. Uh, you know, like you said, bodies also just aren't meant to really throw a baseball the way these pitchers yeah. are doing it. So there's... Uh, it's an unfortunate trend definitely for the sport. And I, I also don't see that being said, I don't see like any sort of quick fix and I don't see teams deciding actually, you know, pitchers are getting hurt too quickly. Let's start scaling back the velocity. Let's scale back the spin rate because then that's going to put you at a perceived competitive disadvantage. Right. And who's going to do that? Nobody, absolutely nobody there. It's just, this is an unfortunate circumstance of stuff that's going on and changes to major league baseball and, Rob Manfred and the consistent push for shortening games, adding more offense, limiting what pitchers can do. Uh, they got tired of low scoring games. Uh, and that, who knows? It's just maybe it's a blip on the radar that all these arms are getting hurt because of changes. Or it's just this is just, a, a like I said, an unfortunate period of time where the most talented arms in Major League Baseball are getting hurt and staying hurt. Uh, so it sucks. It sucks as a fan. I I'm a fan. Like I love watching pitching matchups. Uh, and I don't like the fact that they've trended away from that. I know more offense sells, but I don't think that forcing outcomes of games or like weighing some part of it or, or skewing things more towards the offense is a way to drive really, you know, a good part of the game. I think it's taken away. There's good parts of what Manfred has done. Speeding up a game is awesome, but limiting what or what pitchers can do is kind of taking away from. Yeah, to Rico Degrom, absolutely, it sucks too. I'm a Degrom fan, but uh, it's kind of taking away from a little bit of the flair, a little bit of the dominance of pitching that I've I, I grew up on. Like uh, so, I, it's it's a it's a slippery slope. It's an odd space that baseball is. It's booming. The game is at the high, like the best it's ever been. It's terrific, but they're losing a lot of stars. Yeah, I agree. And I, I'm with you. I, I do miss the days of, you know, going to the stadium and, oh, it's a number one versus a number one. Like the schedule mm -hmm. lined up. We're getting two aces that are just going to duel it out and 
uh, that happens now a little bit in the postseason, but even that, you know, it's changed. You get teams using openers and things like that. Uh, all right, so that covers the pitching front. Let's let's get back to uh, the Dodgers' win against the Twins and look at some offense. Now we'll start with the positive. Uh, James Outman's kind of a little little bit of a, a on a heater since he returned to the lineup Monday night. He had a second home run in the series. Uh, this time it was a three run shot that put the Dodgers up three nothing in the fourth inning. Uh, Scott, there was a lot of external frustration mounting from the fans with Outman's performance so far this season, but. After seeing, you know, kind of these two games, can we say that he's uh, officially on an upswing? I thought you were going to say, is he back? I thought you were going to do that as he can. You can no, say it. Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Not I'll, yet. I'll save that one. I want to see the chat. I want to like, let me know. Everybody put his Outman back and then I'll, then I'll react. I'll, I'll let you know. Like, so Outman, Outman notoriously is a streaky guy. Uh, I'm, I'm happy for him these last few games. Uh, he's that, that series against Chicago Cubs. It was, that was, I don't know about you, Matt, but I could feel, I felt frustration for myself. Like he's just, this is unfortunate outcomes for him. Uh, hitting the ball hard against the Cubs comes out tonight, gets a, you know, 106.2 off the bat, hundred miles an hour off the bat homers on a fastball gets a knock on a curveball. So it's, it's good. It's, it felt like early on in the year. We're still early on in the year, but right away, first first few games, everything was 0-2, always behind in the count, and he would just you know corner himself into a spot where he had the swing. And with these strike zone lately, you don't you have you have no idea. So he was putting himself in some unfortunate spots, but I I'm glad he's working ahead and and really yeah using the cricket bat, Laura. So it changes. I'm I'm glad he's not getting too out, too far outside of himself because there's not stuff that he had to tweak. It's just some some breaks here and there. But he, I like that he's being more aggressive, and maybe he channels a little bit of Corey Seager. Get aggressive if you're. It's better to attack ahead in the count when you know you're going to get a pitch. And if you swing and miss strike one, who cares? Like I, if you're going to start zero and one, whatever. But I'd rather you be aggressive if that's what's going to take for him to really get those outcomes to fall and get better pitches. So I, I just, I don't think he's a guy that's going to go up there and be able to hack it off, like battle out, like a, go from o two to three two and work a walk. He's not that type of hitter. He's Max Muncy type, where we're approaching like top twenty in the league in whiff rate. So I think I think coming into tonight, Outman was like 17th in baseball with worst whiff rate. So he has to find a way to counteract that. And I think it's getting going at the account where uh, he's attacking pitches early on to really get some good outcomes. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the quality of contact he was having to begin this season, because I think that is always like I everybody knows, like I, I don't buy into all of like the advanced stats and chuck like oh his advanced stats are great like then everything's going to be fine like i think there's value in in everything there's you know a balance of some of the good uh some of the older stat and the new age things um but it was certainly encouraging that outman wasn't as much as maybe he was striking out he wasn't literally striking out every single at bat and there were signs that hey he is squaring balls up they're just not falling right now and so that's what we're sort of seeing now. And yes, Laura mentioned it. Like the, the cricket bat, I think, is now going to become uh, the new rage in the Dodgers clubhouse. Obviously, if you haven't heard the story, Shohei Otani said he, it's a, the Dodgers have like a cricket paddle that is customized so that the handle is that of basically a baseball bat. Yep. And I guess during the uh, rain delay in Chicago, Otani picked it up. He was 0 for 2, 0 for 3 at that point. Picked it up, was uh, just taking some swings either against, I don't know if he was hitting off a tee. I think he was hitting off a tee or maybe a pitching machine, actually. Some kind of, you know, a little bit uh, slow velocity type thing. And the rain delay ended and he came back and ended with, a, what, a double and a triple, I think it was. Uh, yeah. And so Jake Altman said, if, you know, Otani, if it's good enough for him, then it was good. If it's good enough for Otani, then it's good enough for him. Yeah. Uh, fair enough. Here we are, you know, two home runs in, in back-to-back games. Isn't that cool though? Like I know, I know you saw this too on the bench. Otani, like Outman is a student, and I noticed this pregame. Like he's sitting on the bench, and Otani's just, I think, fiddling with his bat. And and I thought that was cool baseball stuff. That stuff cameras see, and and as a fan and, a, and a, like an observer, you really look at it like that's a young player. He, you know, that he expects more of himself. And Otani's been there and done that, and he knows he's right. He's right. He's right there. He, he to have a breakthrough, and he's picking the brain of an elite hitter. You know, and that was really a cool thing to see. So I'm going to keep looking out for that. Uh, and I'm glad that these type of stories are coming out with James Outman because I don't like seeing I don't like seeing people immediately say, you know, where's Andy Pajes? And guys, he's Andy Pajes isn't ready. Go look at what he's done to start the year. I'm sorry. I wish he was good, too. But James Outman needs to be a guy. He I, I, I don't like the fact that they're platooning him because he had great splits versus lefties last year. Um, and they need some consistency because outside of Teoscar, uh, you're really trying to find matchups there, unfortunately. So I'd like James Altman to kind of get into a streak 
and do exactly what he's done. That roller coaster rant where when his peak is there, he's an all, like an all-star caliber outfielder. So pick pick his brain, Outman. Go find Otani, sit him down, continue to do that, and keep running it because I'm really getting tired of looking at K rate and whiff rate and seeing him next to Max Muncie. Because I know somebody asked in chat, like, what's Max Muncie's K rate coming into like today? And it was 41. And Outman's like not that bad, but anywhere in that air is rough. Like that's not that's not something that you can absorb with where like with where Taylor is and uh, I don't know who else Taylor and maybe Kike some days. It's just that's a hard thing to have. So Outman needs to be consistent. Yeah, we're gonna have to watch the uh, the comments in the chat. You mentioned Chris Taylor's name, and we haven't gotten we haven't gotten to him yet. But I know I can already see some people are. I'm ready uh, to talk about CT man. Okay, we'll get we'll get there. Let's let's get we'll, let's recognize Will Smith really quick because he also. Uh, Hit a home run tonight. His three run shot. He got some backspin going the other yep. way. A three run shot. Uh, he put the backspin. Dodgers up six nothing. Uh, unlike Outman and a few others, Smith isn't someone where there's really been a whole lot of concern about. But that quietly was his first home run this season, uh, which I I honestly hadn't realized because I felt like he was off to such, he is off to you know a pretty hot start. But yep. how would you uh, sum up what you've seen from Smith so far? Even if you know there hasn't been a whole lot of power mixed in yet. A very like veteran hitter like this is as it's a complete type of guy like we know the powers in there but he feels like he's kind of ascended to a different a different part of his game where I know we spoke I was talking with I think you and Jeff about how when he's good he's finding that hole on the right hand side and shooting it to right field uh and he's doing that a ton he's working the ball inside um, he's being patient which is something that I, he's getting have you noticed that his strike zone is he's been getting killed like he has been, it's been really, I've been picky. I know he's been picky at the plate, but I've been sitting there getting all going off on the umpires, but he's got the, he's tied for the best batting average in the league. And that's, I'm like, he, he could be doing more. Yeah. That's, that's impressive. I think the umpiring just as a whole hasn't been great this season. And I I'm not, I, I want more accountability for the umpires. I think there needs to be more transparency as to how MLB is really policing. Cause look, it, did you see the one uh, and, apologies to everybody with us we're a little bit off tangent right now but angel hernandez there was that pitch it was like middle, it was in the low it was basically middle of the plate right like a little low but not out of the strike zone by any means and he called it a ball yes like that something like that can't happen and i'm not sitting here saying bring me robots i just think the first step needs to be let's get a little bit more accountability on these guys and then see how that goes because john Payne last night was terrible <laughs> What's it? Yeah. What? Like, I, it's just bad. It's just bad. There's nothing else to do it. I mean, like when Dave, for whatever people say about Dave Roberts for Dave Roberts to go off about that. I mean, it's bad. We've seen Mookie Betts get zone has been awful against him. I don't know what it is. The Dodgers have had the, I think what I forgot the actual account name on Twitter, but the MLB umpire auditor, like Dodgers have been like on the worst end of all calls of a combined of every single team. So there's something to it. But there are some umpires who, as somebody said, legally blind. Uh, but I have the question for you, and this is something that's going to be super interesting. If you want umpire accountability, I know I, I wrote the Walker Bueller thing today about uh, the ABS and challenge system. If they bring the challenge system to the league and they put a set number of these um, challenges in place, and if you are successful, you get it back. How many replays are we going to see where an umpire gets the call horribly wrong and it overturns like a big strikeout. And that just consistently happens throughout the game. That's going to make them look so bad. And maybe it's what we need. I hope the challenge system is the thing that they need to do. I'm not, I don't think anybody's ready for like full blown automatic ball strike. That'll be terrible. You throw the worst curveball ever and it'll clip like the, the 4D back right hand corner of the zone and ring them up and we'll be fuming. I'll break every one of my daughter's baby like kid chairs in the house. So it'll be over with. I won't actually do that. Go to bed, Nora. But it, it, the challenge system is something that will expose umpires worse than anything we've ever seen. So we need to do it. Yeah, it I mean, that's – I mean, look, the the NBA, and if like every other sport has the challenge system, right? And there are controversial calls that get overturned. And then the the like in the NBA, like a referee is, you know, how did you miss that? How did you get that wrong? So I think, you know, MLB sometimes is, is a little too uh, – well, it's not even MLB. I mean, I guess it's the umpire. The credit to the umpires for having a strong union of uh, being able to consistently get calls pretty wrong and still uh, not have much repercussions for it. 
It's been positive. Like the, the, the challenge system has been really positive. I Walker Bueller had a quote that he said it worked better than he thought it would, which is really cool because he's a stubborn guy. He's an old school type of pitcher. Don't want this just like you get off my lawn, but it's, it's been positive. It's been positive. I think they'll find MLB. Oh, I hate giving, I hate giving man for any credit, but they've been good with implementation of stuff. Uh, new th- changes to the game. And I think they'll find some, decent area for this i just hope that they don't go full full blown abs i hope it's the challenge system and then they can keep that human element in there and then the challenges can be like limited i don't know I, that's what i want i don't I, I don't know about everybody but we are not prepared for a full blown abs system they're just not that'll be tough that change that'll change the way like um like catching framing that'll change the entire landscape of the big league game yeah i agree and apologies to Will Smith for us getting off on that complete tangent. But like yes. we said, his uh, his home run the other way, his first of the season, put the Dodgers up 6 nothing. They ended up hanging on 6-3. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, just, you know, just another night at the park for uh, Will Smith. Six runs, just adding to it. They're they're just completely adding on, man. This is the team. They, know they broke their streak of at least five runs. But this is a lineup that just has an ability. We saw it last year scored the most runs. And I think you just think Jeff asked me the question, are they going to top this or even maybe you? I, absolutely. Dodgers could absolutely score more runs, but it's going to take some lopsided things. And we saw it tonight. Uh, power throughout, power throughout. Let's find some stability at the bottom half. And then, and then uh, it's going to get fun. Otani, man. He's just something. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can't believe he's a Dodger, man. All right, now let's look at uh, the not so good with the Dodgers lineup. We've been sort of teasing this throughout and we've been asking people to stay patient. Uh, Chris Taylor went 0 for 4 with three strikeouts tonight. He continues to, uh, you know, scuttle maybe is the the nice way of putting it. He's appeared in 11 games so far this year. Not all of them have been uh, starts. So a couple of times it was just one at bat if he's pinch hitting or entering late, whatever the case may be. But he's hitless in 10 of those games. Uh, Scott, Take take this wherever you want, and we'll just go. We'll go from there. He feels like he's at. I know. Anytime I bring Chris Taylor up or or tweet about it or talk about it, people say, "Oh, he just needs more playing time. He just needs more playing time." But we've seen him trend downward for a few years now. Uh, it's tough. Like it's at the point where, yeah, Michael took the words right out of my mouth. It, it might be approaching the point where you eat the contract. I like having CT three around because you know what he's done in the playoffs. But I just I don't know where he fits i don't know because he's had reverse splits for a bit oh he's a guy on the team to hit lefties they just have a ton of reverse split right handers it's just odd it's an odd makeup with their thing like kike was hitting bet right handies writers oh writers righties better last year and it feels like he's going to continue that trend this year chris taylor was the same way he just can't find a barrel to save his life he doesn't look like he's has a good approach uh he looks lost he looks slow uh his process at the plate is super slow defensive wise it's just hard to really justify it i think they they could find at bats from a platoon standpoint somewhere else honestly but it's just he's at a point where what positive can you pull from him he he he's if he finds himself in an o2 spot i have no confidence that he's going to be able to dig himself out of it he's trended down for a bit he's making enough money where the organization's going to be like you can't just cut bait they don't really do that anymore the last one i can memorable one i can really think of was like carl crawford where they're like somebody's making a considerable amount of money we're just going to get him out of the organization he's a, he's a all timer for us and like in the last 10 years of postseason stuff so yeah, clutch in the playoffs see man like I, I get it i totally understand but it's a defeating thing watching him it's tough it's a tough thing as a fan to really watch him go through this. Yeah, I think what's challenging too is there's there's a lot of like nuance to this situation. I know fans don't necessarily want to hear that. I think on one hand, you know, he's had oh, excuse me, sorry, I didn't mean to put that comment. Up. <coughs> excuse me. Everything at the beginning of the season, whether it's good or bad, is always magnified, right? Because it's the only sample size you have. It's you know, ten games, eleven games, twelve games, like. Ultimately, I know maybe it's not necessarily likely with Chris Taylor because, like you said, his struggles do extend beyond just this year. But we could get to the middle of the season and just and not even remember, like, oh yeah, he got off to a slow start. And now he's doing okay. Yep. The other side of that argument and coin, though, is like you mentioned, his struggles extend beyond this season. He's somebody who we have seen can be extremely streaky. Uh, I think for the most part, those streaks have been fewer. They've the upswings have have declined. The number of upswings he has per season ha- have 
diminished each year as we've gone further along in his contract, unfortunately. Uh, whether it's age or whether it's, you know, just whatever, you know, take Chris has been, he's been open about his swing being like you said, he needs plank time. And while he is getting it right now, like he's making uh, a good number of starts. He got to, he was playing in the cup series because there are a couple left-handers they were throwing at the Dodgers. He started tonight. Uh, so he is getting his at bats. He is getting the opportunities. He's just not cashing in. And I think the the issue with him, and it's, we've seen this in the past is it's not so even so much that, Oh, he's, literally 0 for 4 it's that you know it's the three strikeouts it's the two strikeouts where he's not really even giving himself a shot and you know i don't know if you caught it during one of the games i think it, i don't i think it was the twin series maybe the first game uh or maybe it was the cups i don't know but the broadcast was talking about his batting stance and you see how far down his bat was like angled towards the ground yeah. yep yeah no it's yeah I remember when he came up, remember when he came up, like it was like it, it just when they fixed him, it was so rhythm and timing. And it felt like, I mean, maybe it's just playing time. Maybe it's just playing. We keep that's the something I, I want to believe that's the case. But he's he just hasn't done it consistently. He was better in the second half last year. But just like you said, everything's magnified at the moment. And he's just does not have it going. So everybody's wondering, well, we're complaining about one spot of the roster, but these are prolonged issues for him. Um it's just he's so – he was fixed. He was a player that they had – and he had an issue, and they fixed it, and he became one of the hottest players in the team, and that earned him the contract. But now we're at the point – he's almost been a Dodger for a decade. Like, that's that's, that, that's unbelievable. I would have never thought that Chris Taylor would have been a, a player for the Dodgers for this long. So it's getting to the point where – is his production, is he worth keeping on the roster? I mean, he is from a, from a cost standpoint, are they going to be able to find stuff elsewhere? It's just that you, you, the, when all these guys are put together, when Outman doesn't have it going, when Kike doesn't have it going and Taylor doesn't have it going and God forbid they start Austin Barnes all in there. We're talking about like a doomsday four. And then if it's three, that's tough. It's just a, for a, a team of this magnitude to have someone where you're like, you're going to wait three quarters of the season to really have that going. It's just tough. That's that's what it is. If we we're talking about Kike, it'd be a different story. Yeah, and I I think another complicating factor to all of this is, look, like you and I can recognize, okay, Taylor is struggling right now. Like maybe they need to evaluate their options. I don't think a trade or DFA is on the table right now. So there's, there's a lot of complaint. We see it in – you and I can both see it in the chat. People are upset. <laughs> Where would the Dodgers eat? like? Where do they go if it's not like if it's not Chris Taylor? Like like you mentioned, like Kike is not tearing the cover off the ball, and they have these guys, these right-handed hitters that are reverse split guys. So what like is there even a solution right now if you do want to basically you know kind of bench him? Miguel Vargas, Michael said it. There he is too. Yep, he, Mickey V. I know it's that's something that if you're you want to find out if somebody's got it, it it's it'd be Miguel Vargas. I mean, other if you're not going to a trade won't happen right now, guys. Like it's just, it won't happen this early in the season. They, they, it'll either be Key or uh, Miguel Vargas or Andy Pajes, and they'll just see if he can roll that in there. But Miguel Vargas, he's been tearing it. Like he's been driving in runs. He's finding some good barrels, uh, playing left field, free CT three up to play the infield. Like if there's some somewhere out, like Taylor Trammell is going to get DFA'd here pretty soon. It's just that's going to happen. Like, but Jason Hayward, uh, we'll see where he's at, but. Chris Taylor's best as a utility man. Find a spot for him. Defense doesn't slump. Uh, if you want a plus bat to see if somebody within the organization can do it, it's Miguel Vargas because he's been. He, they asked him to move positions again. He's in left field. He's playing well. He's primarily started there, aside from a few days as the team as a OKC's DH. But if there's a direct person without having to make a monumental trade early on in the season, which is tough to formulate, it'd be Miguel Vargas. Yeah, that's a great pick. So let, how long do you think then? Let me let's push let's push this a little bit more. Taylor keeps going down. If Vargas keeps on his current trajectory, how long the, how long does that both need to happen for you think the Dodgers to consider okay, like let's get Vargas up here to start playing left field? A month, um, six weeks, two months. I'll say two months. I'll say two months. Let's say yeah, that's probably a proper spot. Really, I mean, see what you the trade deadline if things kind of shake that up there. I, uh, I would say two months, a month. Yeah, you know, I'll say six weeks, just like you said, six weeks. We'll go there. I think that's a good point because then you can evaluate if you need to do it right before the trade deadline. 
honestly there because if Miguel Vargas doesn't work, then they know that you have to really find something at the deadline more. And I hope hopefully they don't have to go at starting pitching and they can be one of those teams early on that can attack one of those really platoon bats or somebody out there who's cheap. They always are like there's somebody there's teams available or there's guys available at the deadline aside from pitchers. So hopefully the Dodgers can avoid having to really go out and get a pitcher aside from a left-handed reliever uh, and go, go that route. But Taylor to like, what, what would they do with him? That's the tough part. Like it, where do you, that's, that's the really difficult thing for me. I don't know. People are saying six weeks, Jay, like that's just how it is. It, it doesn't matter what he bats. It really doesn't look what he's getting paid. That's the element everyone forgets about. Oh, he, but he's, he's making a ton of money. Like for who he is, a utility man in the big leagues, like he's making a ton of money. You're not just going to DFA him. It sucks as a fan. Like you're like, Oh, you want everybody to produce, but the money aspect is an actual thing. Like you don't just cut bait because then you just free cash. You want to get some production and he's been productive in the past. So you try to squeeze every bit out of, of juice you have out of him. So they will, they will allow him. They will keep him going. And he, he finished the season be- better than he started. So hopefully he can do that again. It's just so early. So this sample size is just really small. And I think, you know, another thing too, the Dodgers are, they're playing for October and they mm-hmm. appear to have, enough strengths throughout the roster that if they need to give CT six weeks, two months to potentially, you know, try to figure it out, it appears that they have that luxury. Yes. There are going to be games here or there where you said, you know, the bottom of the line, it's depending on who's starting, what the, you know, the workload has been for everybody. There could be a few games that pop up where you look at it and it's like, man, you know, spots seven through nine, maybe six through nine are basically automatic out type thing. Dodgers have proven time and time again that they're willing to, you know, withstand that and take their chances. And so, uh, yeah, that's where that's where it stands with Chris Taylor. I think we're we're in agreement that there's not anything that's going to happen uh, in the near future. I think, as much as Chris Taylor sort of struggled, he does have a little bit of a track record with the team, and so we can uh, kind of see where that's going to go. Scott, do you have any closing thoughts on that? Just it, I don't know what matchup for him because he's a reverse splits guy right now. And I'd prefer to see, like when Jason Hayward's healthy, I'd prefer to see him out there. Uh, Gavin Lux is going to be playing second base. Mookie Betts will be at short. Teoscar will be out there. Altman in center field. And then who do you play in left? You know? So it's like you're battling for these slots. And I I would take I would take Kike Hernandez in left field over what we've got going on. So it's just, it's just an odd thing, like to have Chris Taylor making what he is and what his peak is and now where he's at at the plate. He just looks – he looks like he has no command of this of the batter's box at all. He's, it's like he's swinging a sledgehammer and he's an hour late on every pitch. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely been rough, but like we said, it is still really early in the season. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe uh, CT will find his way out of it. All right. Let's, uh, let's finish with some questions. And just as a reminder, if you could start it with a question in all caps, that makes it easier for Scott and I to kind of pick them out as we are scrolling through. Uh, we have a little bit of time here, so we should be able to get to a good number of them. And while we wait for them to come in, uh, Scott, I'll ask you kind of the uh, – it's cooled down a little bit now, but obviously Otani's first home run ball, that whole fiasco. So if you caught it, what are you uh, looking to get in exchange for the ball? I'm I'm getting a ton of – I'm asking for immediately like a like a lot. Like I know how they bullied him. But I would say like – I know I said in the, like our chat, I was like $500,000. See where it gets me. But like 100000 I would ask for that. And if they said no, then I would ask for tickets. Uh, but I would I would make them work for it. And if, if they don't authenticate it right there, so what? I'll get somebody else to authenticate this. <laughs> like you saw what they – like they Yankees fan did with Soto's ball. He just put it in his pocket and then – said, nope, not giving it back. Like, what are they going to do then? Like, you know, it's the ball. You have them on camera. Like, there's ways. Like, I, th- I honestly, I feel like she got bullied and she just didn't know what to do. And then she started to get trolled. And then she hated that everybody was making fun of her. And that's just how it went. That's my opinion. And I think that's, I don't know. I think that's right. I don't care what anybody says. I think she hated that people were flaming her for it. And that's just, she didn't get enough and she knows it. And now the Dodgers hold this historic ball, but... She didn't ask for enough. I would ask for 100K flat. Otherwise, you're not getting it too bad. Yeah. Uh, here, Laura says, "Let's." Uh, she wants to know, does Bobby Miller bounce back tomorrow against the Twins? It's an early game, 10-10 uh, Pacific time. So it'll be an <laughs> afternoon start out there in Minnesota. So is, uh, what do you see from Bobby? 
you know what he's going to do? He's Bobby's going to have one of those starts like Kershaw did uh, when he was making that first start. I think right when I started a DB like two years ago and you asked me to do the, the, uh, what was it? The highlights. No, I think you were on the recap that day. I think I was on the recap yeah. and he was throwing, he was throwing, was it a perfect, was it a perfect game? Or was it a no hitter? I, it, it was perfect for a little bit. I, th- it might've been perfect actually, because that was the whole argument was he has a no hitter already yeah. in his career. He doesn't have a perfect yeah. game. And it had the feeling of it, but then it's in Minnesota. I was terrified. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to slog my way through this recap. And then you're like, I got to take it. Give me the, give me the thing. So I think he's going to shove. We saw it against the Cubs and an inning went South. It sucked pitching in Chicago guys. Like the weather was terrible. It was cold. Um, comes out, dominates the side in the first, and then it just gets away from him. That's just, that's just odd stuff. That doesn't really happen. So I think he's going to shove. Uh, we're going to say, if anybody asks me, I'll see what the prize picks line is for strikeouts on that. I might hammer the over, whatever it is. But I feel like the Dodgers just have an incredible game plan against the Twins. You don't see them very often, and I just think they're out They're out game planning them right now. And Bobby Miller is going to have, I'll say, see if anybody co-signs that. Over under seven and a half strikeouts. Chat, hit me. I'm going to say over. I'll say he gets eight. Uh, what he would? How many innings, Matt? Five, six? I think he goes uh, five and two-thirds. I'm two thirds. Okay. How many strikeouts? Nine. No, I'll do. Uh, I'll do six. Six. Okay, that's cool. That's fine. Yeah, he's been he's been calm. He's been confident pitching into contact lately. But I'm gonna say he gets. I'll say he gets eight, and just keep it right there. I'll say he gets six. Gets eight strikeouts. Pitches some contact. And uh, yeah, we're yeah. He bounces back, Laura. Absolutely. Bobby's gonna cruise. Yeah. Right? Also, I mean, kind of a, a subplot to this. I think the Dodgers have now won like seven or eight in a row in Minnesota. Kind of a random, random stat, but they're on. Yeah, they're wasn't, on yes, wasn't like 13 or 14, something like that I saw before yeah. the game. Some crazy yeah. stuff, man. Just get owned. Sorry, Korea. <laughs> uh, Hawaiian Kira wants to know if you have a, a nickname yet for the first four batters of the Dodgers lineup. I did see people were talking about this earlier. I think Mount Crushmore was thrown out there. It's pretty good. Uh, yeah. And yeah, Will Smith is earning it now. He's there. I don't know. Sorry, I dropped the ball, guys. I know that was my homework assignment. I didn't have it. I'll get me. Yeah, get back to me. Give me. Give me till Thursday. There we go. Give me till Thursday, uh, Kira. I'll get. I'll get back to you. I'm, I'll. I'll send it to you. Let's see here. Ivy wants to know if any of us have tried the Korean fried chicken bucket at Dodger Stadium yet. I have not. I don't. Scott, you haven't yet, right? I haven't been to a game yet. I need to go. I've been getting pestered to go. I got to find a day. And I don't think uh, I'm pretty sure Blake hasn't yet either. You should. They do have. Uh, if you could swing it, they do have an afternoon uh, start coming up. So those those are always the easy ones to get into. I mean, those you might. Nice. If it's not too hot, then it's it's pleasant. If it's hot, then I've been to some toasty games. I remember when I was in high school and they were doing the noon games and the light blue unis. I remember I bought tickets in my first period, printed them on my teacher's computer, checked myself out, went there, and it was so hot. This was like this was like 2010. And it was, I remember they just put a ton, like a ton of fans all over the stadium and it was just sweltering. It was the worst. So yeah, I've, I've been there. I can, I can handle it. All right. Uh, Juan wants to know, can we please send Lux to AAA and keep Rojas at shortstop? Where are you, uh, where are you falling on? I know Lux isn't necessarily hitting. I feel like it, it, the, his results have been the inverse of what everybody expected. I think he's handled second base. Well, I thought he would be fine. At, I thought second base. Even when they were saying they were going to play him at shortstop, I felt like he was a better off as second baseman than the shortstop. But that's a different story. But considering that that position switch did happen because of his defensive struggles, then it was out oh, to keep his bat in the lineup. Well, now he's not necessarily hitting, but he's playing second base adequately. I think he's done better. I think he's done. I don't, has he made an error at second base right recently? He's made some pretty good plays. Yeah, I don't think he has any errors. Yeah, he's had some pretty – he's looked competent there, but we're not asking him to be a defensive first, second baseman. We need him to hit. Like, they do. They need him to hit, and I – I, yeah, he's fine. He's fine. It's not good enough offensively. Absolutely not. Like, he just – he's just not getting it done offensively. But I don't I don't think everybody – I think everybody overlooked what his offense would do. They were like, yeah, we'll just figure it out there, and as long as he can throw a ball to first base and hit the mitt. But now his offense looks terrible. Now he just looks like he's just not in it. So – Rojas, Rojas isn't an everyday guy though. He's just, he can't do that anymore. He just, you, you do that for an extended period of time and then you'll really see like how many, how much his lower leg injuries will catch up with him. Unfortunately, uh, he'll be great defensively and Mookie will be better than Gavin Lux at second base offensively, but you need somebody to give those days off somewhere. It's just, yeah, Gavin Lux needs to turn it on. Otherwise 
Willie Adamas. Blake, I know you're in that's, chat. That's what I was gonna say. So are you are you still in the camp that Mookie shouldn't necessarily finish the season as they're starting shortstop? Like just for his health. Like, because remember, they moved him to the infield to preserve his health. And then like second base, I think, okay, that makes sense. Shortstop is completely different and more demanding. So do you think that Mookie needs to be moved off of that just for his kind of own good and uh length of his career? Yeah, we talked to when when Blake and I spoke with Juan Toribio, he said as much that I mean, they honestly might now Mookie's kind of playing himself into a spot where if they feel comfortable with him at shortstop, it could be for the season. But ultimately, the long term goal, like Mookie's putting enough preparation and he's showing up an hour earlier, hour two earlier than he normally would have otherwise. So Mookie's doing everything to give the organization a chance like to not have to be so aggressive to remedy that. But it's at a point where they might have to, honestly, uh, for his health, for Miguel Rojas to soften the blow in the infield. This is a loaded team. But if things don't go perfectly, like you're going to see the holes like you, you will. Um, but to your to your question about is Gavin Lux or is, is it best for Mookie Betts to stay at shortstop? It's not. It's really not. He can win an MVP because he's a shortstop. You'll, he'll win a gold glove. If he's a shortstop, I think so. I really do. Uh, but for the original plan that they set out, it was just it's it's odd that they locked him in as the everyday second base baseman in like December. Dave Roberts said it, and then they were fast to say we need you at short. So it kind of feels like they're they're not as confident in Gavin Lux as they might think. Uh, which is which is pushes me to the point that we could see them being aggressive at the deadline for something. But if I won't be surprised if they let Mookie Betts play shortstop for the entire season. And then at that point, do you think, let me ask you, if Mookie Betts is a shortstop for the rest of the season, do, like is second baseman is still a big concern? I mean, if Lux isn't hitting at all. Not at all. And he's, yeah. Probably because then at that point you're like, what's the what are the odds that Lux, Taylor, Kike, all those guys are struck? Like, if that, right, if if two out of those three are struggling, which the odds right now might lean that way, then you need. I think you need to figure something out. And then to the bigger point of, they have these right-handed hitters who are reverse split guy. Like my joke, and we've talked about like the, every year the Dodgers always seem to need a right-handed hitting position player. <laughs> Typically, it's in the outfield. Maybe they try to find somebody who could play second base and also hits right-handed and can, you know, crush some left-handed pitching. Gavin Lux, I, I don't. If Mookie is staying at shortstop, I don't know how much Gavin Lux factors into their plans moving forward. If he doesn't necessarily start hitting, uh, and they have, you know, they just signed Will Smith to that big extension. They have a lot of young catchers in the in the pipeline. So there's there's some trade chips that have been uh, stacked up pretty quickly. Yeah. I know I see Michael in the chat. It's Tyler Olino. You know, I know Blake texted me about that today as I was watching the Red Sox game and he hits his sixth homer of the year. We want a Tyler O'Neill. We could be done. Like there, there's this is the nice thing. If they have figured it out that starting pitching is a back burner thing for them and they just they have enough. Let's let's knock on wood that all these things happen. Uh, let's say Walker Bueller comes back and he's solid. I weep. Uh Kershaw, we'll see, and they have enough where they don't have to attack starting pitching and allocate resources that route. Bullpen will be fine. Then they can just completely – what is Blake saying? Shut up, Blake. They can, then they can just really focus on finding just like a, a utility guy, a bat somewhere where they can do it. The tough part is that Otani's going to slot in DH, so it's not going to be a DH. But a corner outfielder, there's a ton. There's always a lot out there. So Tyler O'Neill could be one, Michael. I'm with you, man. Tyler O'Neill, bring biceps out west. We do have a super chat, uh, and it's about a, a little bit of a delicate subject. Trust Genius wants to know if it's true that Uria signed an MMA contract. I have not seen that. It is uh, being reported that he does face uh, five misdemeanors for getting arrested over uh, kind of the domestic violence situation that he unfortunately was part of. Uh, so that's where that stands. Yeah. Um, let's see. Let's get back. I did see some follow-up questions. To There was one about Alex. Ve oh, here we go. Jaime Gonzalez says, thoughts on Vessia. Love the guy's passion, but it seems like he's trying to overpower hitters, but they're teeing off on the flat fastball. Yeah, I got to, I know, I, I, I advocated for Alex Vessia, and I've been, I, last year after he came back up, he was terrific. Uh, but he's prone to giving up the long ball. It's, it's good today that that home run didn't factor into the game, really. But sure. Like he's not, he's not a lefty that's going to come out there and get both sides of the plate out. He's definitely someone who needs to be in the right situation. 
Uh, flat out, he should not be the only lefty in the bullpen. He really shouldn't. The Dodgers at the deadline need to attack a left-handed reliever. Tanner Scott from the Marlins is a, is a guy that I'd really love them to target. Um, but I am worried about Alex Vesia. If he doesn't, uh, I think San Diego, I mean, like to some extent, like that thing kind of broke him. Like that knocks a lot of his confidence there. And he hasn't been as consistent. But uh, to Blake's point, relievers are volatile, pitchers break. Uh, but I really do think that Alex Vesia should be a second option and not the number one. But I also don't think that Caleb Ferguson should have been with the team and that he's just, just a far superior option than Alex Vesey. I think they just they believe that he could get the job done and that their right handed arms could get like could be OK without having multiple lefties in the bullpen. But I am worried about Alex Vesey. Yeah. Yeah, I think what's so the Dodgers plan, like what they at least kept saying is, you know, we we're not so much worried about what hand a relief pitcher throws with as we are of, you know, do they have the stuff to get out left or right handed hitters or both? Like you said, they were comfortable with Alex Vesia being their only lefty because of other options they had. One of them being Bruce Gratterall, who hasn't pitched yet. Another one being Blake Trinan, who hasn't pitched yet. So that, I think, has further like highlighted the fact that the Dodgers only have one lefty in the bullpen. And then you mm -hmm. layer in that he's sort of struggling. And so I think maybe it, the overall picture looks a little bit worse than what they anticipated and what hopefully it'll end up being once the group gets healthy. Uh, let's see. I did see a question in here. Mr. Seabad says, if Mookie, is Mookie the MVP if he stays at shortstop and tears it up at the plate? Yeah. He's, I mean, if he's, he's, pulled off, he's pulled off a little bit, he's not, uh, he's not off to the blistering uh, start that he was a, a week ago. Yeah, no, it's, it's Mookie's, uh, he's been, he's been getting a ton of bad calls that have been putting him behind. I'm not going to say that's, that's it, but yes, he's cooled off. Absolutely. But uh, sure. He can win MVP if he, if he keeps tearing it up. Absolutely. Like he'd done that. But I, I, I really want people to understand how remarkable it is for a 31 year old in the big leagues to move off of a position that he's a like a five time gold glover uh, to step on onto the dirt and to come in and, and really make it a, a challenge for him and challenge himself this late after he gets paid for whatever you think about Mookie Betts. And yeah, those guys drive Benz's too. Uh, that type of statement. He is filling, I know, I know, but he's filling a need for a team that has aspirations bigger than just this year. He's trying to be whatever they need him to be. And it's just also coupled on the fact that he's an MVP caliber hitter at the plate. So it's it, there's a lot to be said about what Mookie Betts is doing. And now it's to the point where it's, he's slotting in there every day at shortstop and you don't even think about it. And that, yeah. how often does that happen? How often does that happen with a superstar in his age 31 season? Never. It just doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. Alex Aguirre wants to know, is there a stadium giveaway you're looking forward to this year? Uh, there's an Otani bobblehead. There's two Otani bobbleheads. I think an Otani hat, an Otani t-shirt, Yamamoto bobblehead. Uh, Walker Bueller bobblehead still coming up. Um, I haven't looked, I'll be honest. I don't have yeah, no that's idea. Why was, that's why I was trying to name as I many looked, as I, I could for you. Uh, Bruce Dark Gratterall bobblehead, I think, is still coming up. Uh, Jason Hayward City Connect, which I assume when they announced that it was a City Connect, I thought that was kind of weird. But then the Dodgers were uh announced as having a new City Connect uniform this season, so I imagine that the Hayward bobblehead will be in the newer version, which then I think is kind of cool. Um, they're doing, a, I think, a Kobe jersey giveaway again, or at that'll least like, always that'll always be popular. At least this time, it's actually going to be a giveaway instead of last year. You had to buy kind of the, the ticket back back for it. Yeah, I um, think that stuff's so lame. I really do. I'll be honest with you. I know it's like I, know, I get it, but I think like making stuff a ticket package is so lame. Give it to fifty thousand fans. Cares. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I think the the Kobe one for me will probably is probably the one I'm most looking forward to. Uh, let's see. We'll take a few more here before we close it out. I saw one about Yamamoto that I wanted to talk about. I forgot who who said it. They're okay. talking about his fastball. So, oh, I did see that. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Are you concerned? Oh, here we go. Any concerns about the Yamamoto fa about Yamamoto's fastballs? It seems at least so far it's getting hit hard and not getting much swing and whiff. Yeah. So he for sure. Like if you pull up his heat map, like he's correcting it like he has like he's worked to correct that and i think a lot like a ton of this data that's early on is skewed because of his early starts uh like his early like his start in the korea series so i think that skews a ton of his numbers but if you look at his heat map like he's missing a lot down in the zone 
And he has the ability to ramp it up to upper nine, like mid to upper nineties, which is terrific. And he, that he has to play that off of his splitter, but he's having a tough time lining up his tunnel uh, release point, same exact thing. So you are, people have already seen what his splitter can do and his devastating curveball. It's just a matter of finding a good mix and it's a game. He needs to make sure that he wins that final pitch that he can get ahead. But when that fastball is there, he's trying, if he's putting a hitter away, he needs to make sure it's up in the zone because otherwise it's going to be a flat fastball. And when we've seen it, it looks like a flat fastball, but he needs to line up the, that, that release point. So then the tunnel is as effective as it can be because he has, I would say the number one splitter in baseball. I don't care. And that curveball drops from the sky. So when he's getting whiffs, uh, he's right. And we've seen that recently. Uh, but his data right now is just incredibly skewed because of that first start. Yeah. Great. Uh, good call on getting that question. That's a, uh, that's why uh, we love having Scott on these shows to answer those types of things because he gets it. He's uh, the I give him a hard a hard time about being the nerd guy, but that's stuff that he that he picks up on and brings uh, to our show. All right. I think this will probably be the last one. Uh, Blake Williams. I don't know if you're familiar with him, Scott, but he wants to know if the Dodgers will play in the Hayward City Connect jerseys when Fanatics doesn't send the real ones. Uh, this has been kind of a little bit of a problem for multiple teams throughout the league, not getting their city connect uniforms in time. I think the giants were the most recent team. I think they're supposed oh, to wear theirs. I think they're supposed to wear theirs tonight and they didn't arrive. Uh, the twins wore theirs today against the Dodgers, but I think they were supposed to wear them earlier in the season, but they hadn't arrived yet. So there've been uh, some delays. I saw, I don't know if it was the Mariners and Blake, maybe if you're still here, you could correct me. The Mariners are one team like is having to wait until June for some reason. Uh, so yeah, that's where that stands. So I guess the Dodgers have not said when they're planning to unveil their new city connect jerseys, much less wear them. My guess is because of that, they'll probably pick out a date far enough in advance where it'll be safe. Uh, but we'll see Scott, do you have any predictions on what ends up happening with fanatics on that front? I'll leave that to Blake. I don't, I had no idea. That just sounds insane. It's 2024. They're really having issues with these. Maybe they should just stop the city connects. What are your takes on the Philadelphia Phillies ones? Do you like them or not? The colors are too weird. Like I, it's just different, right? So yeah. It's so like, different. why is it like that? I like I, them, but they're just like, why? I felt like if they were going to go like that extreme in blue, they should have just tried to match up with some of like the old uh, 76ers looking uniforms, like on that color scheme. That way, at least it resonates with like the city. And I haven't read the details. I'm sure there's an explanation for why it's what are they like blue, yellow and all that. Right. It's like a, it's like a, it's a couple shades of blue, but it's so nice. Yeah. I like them. I like them. Sorry. There you go. No, that's fine. I mean, this is different. It's just different. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think a lot of them have been, Okay, I, I feel like Giants ones are. <laughs> I feel like that it's like fifty percent have been yeah. have been good. The other have been not so great. I think uh, it's been interesting to see the uh, the Dodgers kind of go through different iterations of theirs since they first unveiled it. You know, they changed the hat, then they changed the pants. Uh, yeah, because the all the all blue look was just was not good. It wasn't it. They were really bad. They yeah. just they big yawn. I wouldn't buy one of those. If someone ever offered it to me half off, I wouldn't buy it. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty bad. I didn't like them. I just didn't. I didn't like it. Why? Yeah. What are we doing? No, I, I really. I, I somebody in chat can co-sign this. I hope. I really want them to bring back the late '90s uh, road Dodgers unis with the blue piping, grays mm -hmm. with blue piping. Yeah, the that would be good. The, the best. That would be good. All right. We have one more super chat. So let's uh let's close it out with this. Trust Genius says El Compadre or Shortstop Bar. I'm not familiar. I've heard of them, but I have not been to either of them. Uh Scott, I don't know if you have and if you could pick. No idea. So sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, sorry. Thank you for the super chat, though. We do certainly appreciate it. Hopefully, uh our viewers will be able to answer that for you. Um, all right. Well, that's going to do it for Scott and I. Uh, thank you, everybody who joined us live. And just as a reminder, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, ring the notification bell, and hit like on this video specifically. And if you're listening via podcast, we definitely appreciate that as well. Please subscribe, rate, and review us there. Uh, we're going to have different videos up throughout the week. Our next live show is scheduled for Friday night, so that'll be a post game one. I believe the plan right now is for that to be uh, Jeff and Anthony. And then I'll be back, I think, probably with Blake on Sunday night. But 
that's for live. That's on the live front. We're going to have uh, content. Scott's got going to be having a video up later in the week. So definitely keep your eyes out for that. Again, that's Scott. I'm Matthew. Thanks for joining.